Hello, this is Dr. Craig Thomas. Today we're going to talk about billing and coding the medical eye examination. One of the reasons that this very basic topic seems to be so confusing to many optometrists is that there's so many different definitions of medical eye examinations or, or eye examinations in general. And this slide kind of illustrates that where you've got the standard optometry school definition, a federal government definition, state government, Medicare, uh, whoever's paying for the bill, uh, the medical legal definition, which a bunch of, of doctors and lawyers, and the definition that's in current procedural terminology, which is the basis for everything. So there's a bunch of different definitions for eye exams, which leads to some of the confusion. Now let's start with the, the one that we were all trained with, the optometry school definition. And you see the optometry school definition has all your standard service components like patient history, visual acuity, tonometry. Most importantly, at the very bottom you see that the optometry school definition also includes a refraction, uh, which is in direct contraindication to uh, current procedural terminology guidelines. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing there, which I think is one of the main reasons that it leads to so much confusion. We're trained to include a refraction in the eye exam when CPT tells us that a refraction is an independent diagnostic test and is not a part of an eye exam. You have the federal government definition, <clears throat> which is very simple. Uh, it says basically a patient is a person who has had an eye exam. Uh, an, an exam is the process of determining a refractive condition. So according to the federal government, uh, an eye exam is basically determining a person's refractive error, and there's absolutely no mention of any health assessment, glaucoma screening, disease detection, anything like that. It's a, a totally simple refractive thing, which makes no sense, but that is the federal government definition. You've got state definitions, and most of us practice in states where optometry is regulated by the state board. For example, I practice in Texas, <clears throat> and in Texas we have uh, what, what the Texas Optometry Board calls a spectacle examination, uh, and you see the documentation requirements lifted on the side. Again, very similar uh, to, to uh, the optometry school definition and has the same flaw where it includes a refraction in the definition of an eye exam in direct contraindication to current procedural terminology. Uh, for Texas, these requirements only apply if you're receiving an initial prescription for glasses or contact lenses. The fourth big uh, uh, category would be Medicare's definition. And in Texas, our Medicare carrier is Novitas, and currently Medicare, or Novitas, has absolutely no documentation requirements for an eye exam uh, at all. Uh, so there's essentially no rules as far as performing eye examinations with our Medicare carrier, and based on my research, there's no Medicare carrier in the country uh, that has rules or regulations that govern how we provide eye examinations. All the LCDs for eye examinations have been retired over the past few years. So there's essentially no rules, and when there are no rules printed, then you default to current procedural terminology definitions and guidelines, which is what we'll talk about in a little bit. You also have a medical legal definition for an eye exam. Uh, and I, I've used these two cases to illustrate the, the medical legal concept of of delivering eye exams. Uh, the first example is, is uh, Helling versus Carey. Uh, this happened back in the 70s. Uh, it was a, a situation where a young woman had gone to an ophthalmologist repeatedly uh, for contact lens care, had complained that her vision was, was diminished. Uh, the ophthalmologist that were taking care of her uh, saw her multiple times and never measured her intraocular pressure. Finally, in frustration, she sought a second opinion uh, the doctor that examined her with the second opinion diagnosed her with advanced open angle glaucoma and she sued the first doctor for failure to diagnose glaucoma. Uh, they went to trial, uh, the, the, the plaintiff, uh, the, the patient said, hey, I went to the doctor, I should have been diagnosed with glaucoma, I had risk factors that should have been easily to see uh, if the doctor simply would have looked. The doctor got up and testified that this was a young white female and young white females hardly ever got glaucoma, the risk of a young white female getting glaucoma was so low that they never even measured the intraocular pressure on the patient because the risk was so low statistically. Well, we know now that that's a bunch of nonsense and the doctor should have measured the person's pressure no matter what. Uh, the patient won, the doctor lost, 
uh, you had failure to diagnose glaucoma because the judge said if you had simply measured the pressure, you probably would have determined that she had glaucoma, which was true. And overnight, back in the mid-70s then, it became standard of care for an eye doctor to measure intraocular pressure on every patient regardless of age. And if you can't somehow measure that pressure, you're supposed to refer the patient to a doctor that can. Uh, that's how important it is. So we can define eye exams all we want. We can use an optometry school definition. We can use a, a Medicare definition, a, a federal government definition. I think now you have this medical legal definition that's defined by judges and lawyers that says we have to measure pressure on everybody. I think the medical legal definition trumps practically everything, honestly, in this country. And the second example here versus United States, uh, kind of a famous case that happened you know, 10, 15 years ago where uh, a, a family took their young child to uh, an optometrist at the VA hospital. Uh, they were military dependents. Uh, unfortunately, the child had uh, retinoblastoma, had a, had a cancer in the eye. The examining optometrist did not detect the retinoblastoma at the initial visit, and the examining optometrist did not dilate the young child uh, to, to facilitate the fundus examination. Uh, the, the tumor got bigger, became easier to see, uh, the family got a second opinion, second doctor diagnosed the kid with retinoblastoma, and they sued the first doctor saying he should have diagnosed my kid's cancer, uh, and all they had to do was dilate the eye to see it, which was probably true. Uh, this case, I think, got, set, got pushed to the side because I don't think you could settle the government, uh, sue the government, but the, the standard was set, and overnight it became standard of care that we're supposed to dilate everybody's eyes, regardless of age, uh, to, to get the best view of, of the internal eye that you can. And if you can't dilate them or won't dilate them, you're supposed to send them to someone that can. So you've got case law now in the record where you've got a medical legal definition of an eye exam where everybody's supposed to have their pressure checked, everybody's supposed to be dilated, and, and this medical legal definition did not come from the optometrist and ophthalmologist. It didn't come from the eye doctors. It came from the legal system, uh, which to me is extremely significant. And so you've got to remember that when you're talking about billing and coding the medical eye exam, performing a medical eye exam, I think it's really important to remember that from my perspective, I believe all eye examinations are medical eye exams. Every time you touch a patient, every time you shake their hand, no matter what, whether it's a contact lens check, anything, the, the, the instant you touch them, it's a medical eye exam. Uh, you've got to remember that optometrists are held to the same medical legal standard of care as ophthalmologists when it comes to diagnosing disease. Diagnosing disease is the key. Hardly ever do you get in trouble from, for treating disease. It's, it's the failure to diagnose. Uh, you've got to remember that many eye diseases present at various stages of their natural history without symptoms. And, and so the, the, the uh, stuff that we have to go through contractually with some of the vision care plans where you're, you're supposed to allow the patient to self-diagnose and and allow the patient to determine the reason for the visit, I don't think that's the best way to deliver medical eye care. Uh, and again, this, the, the stats show that practically all malpractice claims against optometrists are for failure to diagnose the disease, not failure to treat it. As we, as we move into this medical realm and, and uh, medical optometry or, or optometric practices that have uh, a medical orientation to them are growing each and every year, uh, when you talk to doctors that, that don't embrace a medical model and are not moving forward in this direction, many of them express fears of being sued. They, they, you know, I'm not comfortable doing this. I, I might mess up something. I'm afraid I'm going to get sued. And I, I've heard it repeatedly. And as so I put this slide in here to kind of quell that, there's an average of 35 claims paid each year on optometric malpractice. When you consider that there's 40,000 optometrists in the country and the millions of people that we examine every year, to have only 35 adjudicated claims a year is really a, a testament to our, our, our skills and abilities uh, and that we don't overreach. We don't do things that we can't do. We, you know, we're very careful uh, and the statistics show that. Uh, you see the, the, at the bottom of the slide the, the top five reasons 
uh, that eye doctors are sued, and it's failure to diagnose these things. It's, it's not failure to treat glaucoma, it's failure to, to diagnose glaucoma. It's failure to, to diagnose the retinoblastoma. And the, at the bottom there, the, the choroidal neovascularization and diabetic retinopathy, uh, in particular, uh, most of the, there's lots of new studies coming out showing that in many, many patients with diabetes and, and diabetic retinopathy, the retinopathy begins in the far retinal periphery, and, and we've been trained to concentrate on the posterior pole, and these cases are occurring where doctors are not dilating them, doing an ophthalmoscopy exam on the posterior pole, not seeing any active diabetic retinopathy, and they're simply not getting out far in the periphery, and the diabetic retinopathy is active there, and by the time it gets into the posterior pole, the person's vision is either diminished or, or severely threatened, and people are getting mad and suing because they know that they should have been diagnosed. So although we, we, it is serious and we've got to be cognizant of optometric malpractice, in, in the big picture, as long as you do your job right, it should not be something that you have to worry about as you go forward in this medical model. One of the biggest things that we see constantly as, as, as a lecture around the country, friends of mine calling, talking about, it's a constant thing, no matter what, no matter where, is this coverage decision making. Uh, doctors and patients uh, sometimes being at odds, uh, sometimes having, having problems, uh, deciding who's going to be responsible for paying for the visit. Is it going to be the patient paying for the visit? Is it going to be their medical insurance? Is it going to be their vision insurance? Is it going to be a combination of the above? Who makes that decision? Does the doctor make it always? Does the patient make it always? You know, what's, what's, who's going to pay? Uh, and it, it, it hardly, ever, hardly ever does the patient want to pay. Uh, the doctor always wants to get paid. So the, you've got rules that you've got to be aware of with, with coverage decision making. Uh, kind of the, the big gorilla in the room is always Medicare, so use Medicare as your base. And remember that Medicare's rules say that the coverage of an exam is dependent upon the purpose. Uh, and the purpose, if the purpose is, is to correct a refractive error, to get a new pair of glasses, the exam's not covered. Uh, if the purpose is, is to, uh, to fix some kind of eye disease or diagnose an eye disease or an injury uh, or to, to, to fix some kind of body part like a, a cataract, then the visit is covered and it's medically necessary. Uh, so, so what we always run into is the problem where we have dual coverage. It's, it's a, a problem that most other health professions don't have to deal with, uh, but optometrists and ophthalmologists, uh, optometrists in particular, are always met, met with this conundrum of, of who's in charge, who's paying. Is it the patient's vision insurance or the medical insurance? Uh, and to me, the final decision almost always is going to be the decision of the, the optometrist. Uh, it's the, the judgment of the optometrist that decides uh, what mechanism is going to be used to pay. On occasion, there will be some vision care plans uh, that, that dictate the patient gets to decide the coverage decision making. And if you've signed the contract that says the patient allow, is allowed to make that decision no matter what, then in those cases where you're seeing patients under that insurance plan, you've got to follow their rules and the patient would be allowed to make the decision no matter what. If you are not practicing under those constraints, then to me the eye doctor is always the one making the decision. And as we talk about this, again, we're, we're talking about the billing and coding, the medical exam, and, and really all the, 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 the tests that would go with it, too. When, one of the main issues, problems, hassles that I've seen talking with doctors as they make this decision and as they attempt to convert patients from vision care insurance to medical care insurance, one of the biggest no-nos to me is that the doctor will attempt to convert patients that have relatively minor eye diseases. So, so it's, if you've got a patient that has Blue Cross insurance with a $50 copay and they've got VSP insurance with a $10 or a $0 copay and, and the patient is there to get glasses or contacts and they casually mention, yeah, by the way, my eyes are dry too since you asked, uh, but that's not really what I came in for, then that's not a type of patient visit that you're going to really want to try to convert from vision insurance to medical insurance. All it's going to do is, is probably upset the patient, produce a lot of drama. If you don't do it yourself, your staff is going to have to take the brunt of the abuse. It's just a bad deal. Uh, and so my recommendation as you make these decisions about who's going to pay is that it's much easier and I think more appropriate to, to try to convert patients that have risk factors or signs or symptoms of serious disease, glaucoma, cataracts, 
diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, conditions that are vision threatening, I think are very easy for the patient to understand the nature of the problem and why you're going to be using their medical insurance. The person that casually mentions that my eyes are itching and you hand them a, a bottle of Pataday or a prescription for, for some uh, other type of, of, of a steroid or eye drop, where it's, where it's kind of just almost nothing, leave that alone to me. You go to the vision insurance, just go to the next patient and, and, and don't create any drama. So this coverage decision making is a constant source of, of friction and, and tension in the office. And I think if you just use those guidelines I just said, you can reduce that to where it's not a problem and it'll be better for you, your patients, uh, and your staff. So th that's all we've got to say on coverage decision making. Now let's kind of pivot a little bit. We talked about some background talked about different definitions of, of eye exams and you see at the bottom of this slide I've kind of got my, 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 my prime directive where it says whoever is paying is the one that makes the rules well that's the golden rule the, whoever has the goal rules so if Medicare is paying for the visit Medicare makes the rules if the patient is paying they can make their own rules uh, you don't have to do anything you want if the patient's paying cash uh, if, it, if it's uh, superior vision, you've got to follow their rules. Whoever is paying for it is, is whoever is making the rules. That's, that's the, the guideline that I would go by. So now let's talk about reporting our services. You know, we're gonna, you're going to perform an eye exam. It's going to be a medical eye exam. All eye exams are medical eye exams. And now you've got to report this. And a, another big issue, and it's bigger than it should be, is, is the issue of what exam do I report? Do I report comprehensive exams? Do I report intermediate exams? Do I report evaluation and management services? So we'll kind of get into that a little bit. Uh, so when you're reporting services, you've got to kind of know the, the big things. You know, CPT is the code, the, the guidebook. Every, all the information is coming out of CPT. Uh, is relative to uh, diseases, uh, you know, for the next four, five, six months, we're going to be still dealing with ICD-9. Everybody knows that ICD-10 is, is coming up on October 1st. Uh, that's a whole nother lecture, so we can't get into too much of that, but just realize it's coming. Everybody knows it's coming. And when you're reporting services to Medicare, and I use Medicare as our base. Medicare is the guide. Uh, if you can follow Medicare's rules, you generally can follow anybody's rules. Uh, remember with Medicare, you've got four things to consider. The clinical indications, which is what can I do the exam for, uh, or any test to, of course. Uh, documentation requirements. What do I have to prove that I did? What do I have to write down? What do I, what do I have to type in the computer? Coding guidelines, uh, any, any, any specific uh, modifiers, bundles, exclusions, rules, and regulations that I need to be aware of when I'm actually reporting the examination to whoever's paying for it. And of course, utilization guidelines. How often can I do things? How often can I perform a comprehensive exam? How often can I perform an intermediate exam? Uh, how often can I do this test? Those are, are utilization guidelines. And remember, whoever's paying for it is the one that makes the rules on all this stuff. Now, for current procedural terminology, let's, let's start with them. It, the, the, the abbreviation is CPT. Everybody, everybody generally refers to this stuff as CPT. Uh, we have a, a big giant book called the CPT code book, which has all of the rules and the regs in it. Uh, fortunately for us, for eye doctors, in that big giant book of hundreds of pages, there's only about 10 pages that apply to us, so it's really not that complicated. Uh, some doctors make it more complicated than it is. One of the things that I use to simplify it is that my first recommendation when you are billing and coding a medical eye exam is that 99% of the time you only consider using the general ophthalmological services. Uh, there's, there's two levels of service, intermediate and comprehensive. Uh, you know, there's, there's a new patient, there's an established patient, so there's four codes. Uh, some, some doctors, some experts, some consultants uh, say that you should blend in all the evaluation and management codes and, and, and have a nice even mix and a bell curve distribution of services. And I assume or presume uh, that there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I, I believe that eye doctors should use eye codes because that's what they are for. Uh, most of the Medicare people that if you could get them to get on record and say anything about it would agree. Uh, the fact that there's no local coverage determinations for eye examinations right now strongly suggests that Medicare really doesn't care too much about this stuff because they don't have rules and regs on it. They trust us. Uh, they've got bigger fish to fry. They're looking at other stuff to, to audit uh, rather than eye exams. 
regarding eye exams, Medicare's only issue has generally been overutilization of comprehensive services where some doctors, every time they touch the patient, they want to bill a comprehensive service because it pays so high, and that's just not medically necessary all the time. And so what we'll get into here in just a moment is how do you determine the intensity of the exam because the intensity of the exam is a function of medical necessity. You only provide the service that is needed, not what you want to do. You do what the patient needs. So when you're determining medical necessity, according to Medicare, which is always our base, services should be for the diagnosis and treatment of an illness or injury or to improve the functioning of a malformed body member, which for us is always, almost always going to be the eye. Uh, and the second bullet is worth reading again out loud. Medical services furnished at the most appropriate level that can be provided safely and effectively to the patient. And this is, this is expressed as frequency. So how many exams are you going to do in some time period? How many, how many times are you going to examine them in a month? Or how many times are you going to examine them in a year? And the intensity of the exam, which is basically be what kind of exam are you performing? Are you performing an intermediate exam? Or are you performing a comprehensive exam? Uh, so the, the, the last thing to remember, the service that's reasonable and medically necessary, it meets but doesn't exceed the patient's medical need. That's a big deal. So when you're, you talk about determining medical necessity, reporting the services, medical decision making, the intensity of the exam, how, how, how much of an exam are you going to do, is defined by the number and the type of service components. And that's the correct terminology that we should use. There's service components, the service components that are performed during the exam. And you make these decisions based on your own judgment, the patient's history, and the nature of the problem. Uh, so uh, an exam for a patient coming in complaining of an acute loss of vision uh, or a, acute double vision is going to be much more serious, the nature of the problem is serious, than the person complaining of ocular surface disease or foreign body sensations with no change in vision. So the judgment of the doctor, the patient's history, and the nature of problem, that's how you decide how intense you're going to be. You, you roll those three things in together. So we're talking about the general ophthalmological services. Those are the four codes that are listed in the CPT code book for eye examinations. Those four codes. That's all it is. So you've got a new patient exam that's comprehensive and established, a new patient exam that's intermediate and an established. If you want to roll in the other 10 evaluation and management codes, you can, but I, I just I don't think it's necessary the vast majority of the time. Uh, if you've got an extremely simple patient or an extremely complicated patient, then you can do that. Other than that, these four codes are going to take care of 99% of your needs, in my opinion. What the CPT codebook says is that these nine things make up the service components of an eye exam. History, general medical observation, fields, and so on. These nine things. It's not 12 things. It's not 15 things. There's not a refraction involved in it. It's these nine things. These nine things are the things that you can do to make up an eye exam according to the current procedural terminology. <clears throat> and and the, you, you have certain combinations of these service components that are required to report certain intensities of exam. So for example, in the first column under comprehensive exam, you see the seven things that are required to report this level of service, patient history, general medical observation, and so on. On the other column, you see the intermediate exam, which only requires five service components. So remember, there's nine altogether. You've got to have the right combination of seven service components to report a comprehensive exam, and you've got to have the right combination of the five service components to report an intermediate exam. The easiest way to think about this, it's really so easy. If you look in the first column, you see that a basic sensory motor examination and gross visual fields are required to report this level of service. So you're examining a patient. If you do not have to do a basic sensory motor exam, or gross visual fields to take care of that patient on that day, then you can't report a comprehensive exam. A, a prime example would be the patient with uh, a corneal foreign body. Uh, you walk in the room, uh, the patient is in the, in the dark room, he's in pain, uh, you figure out what's going on, you, uh, you examine the cornea with a slit lamp, you take the foreign body out. Uh, the patient is happy, everybody's happy, so you come back the next day. To me, on that visit, it is not necessary for me to do any type of 
gross visual field examination, no kind of confrontations, nothing. Uh, I don't need to do any basic sensory motor stuff. I don't need to check versions or ductions, measure accommodative app. I don't need to do any of that type stuff. The patient is in pain, and all I need to do is take that foreign body out of the eye. Because the patient is in pain, and because the nature of the problem is quite serious, even vision threatening, many doctors will automatically default when they report the service and report a comprehensive level exam associated with taking that foreign body out. What you have to realize is that no matter how serious it is, no matter how much pain the person was in, if you don't need to perform the service components that are required to report a comprehensive level exam, then you can't report a comprehensive level exam. And, and in that situation that I explained, the service components that would be needed to report that exam are really not medically necessary on that day at that time. So you've got to be aware of that. The seriousness is not a factor. The time spent is not a factor. Do you need to do these service components? Yes or no? That's how you determine the intensity of the exam. And what the CPT codebook says is you've got you know, standard clinical indications. Uh, that, that are what they call serious, uh, that, where you need a complete evaluation of the system, glaucoma, cataract, retinal disease. So generally, if you're looking at conditions like that, it is much more likely that you're going to be performing comprehensive level services. Uh, you see comprehensive level services can rule out disease. And again, the complete visual system is the, the key phrase that they're looking at when you report these comprehensive level services. For the intermediate, uh, what the CPT codebook says is that it should be a a, a, a new existing problem complicated by a new management problem and I have talked to literally dozens and dozens of doctors that get stuck on this literal definition in the CPT codebook about when you can use an intermediate exam and the, and the codebook saying that you know you've got to have an existing problem let's say the person's got glaucoma and then it's got to be complicated by a new problem so let's say that they all of a sudden develop dry eye and if you didn't have that exact combination, then you're not supposed to report an intermediate level service. I have had discussions with medical directors and members of the CAC committees for Medicare, the carrier advisory committees, and we have brought this issue to the table more than once asking medical directors how literal we should interpret the CPT codebook when reporting this service. And all I could say is that when, when we question them and say, hey, is this a big deal? Do we need to worry about this? Uh, you know, d does it really have to be exactly like the book says? Uh, the, the answer is no. Uh, so you can take the literal uh, translation in the book if you want to, but in the real life, it doesn't really matter, and the answer is no. Uh, so I think you're going to report intermediate level services whenever you don't report comprehensive level services, and you hardly ever are going to report any evaluation and management services. So let's talk about these service components. Let's finish up with that and get a little bit of detail on these service components. So the first thing is patient history. Now, so these are the nine things that make up the exam. And so again, it's been a while. We've all been out of school a while. These are the nine things. And unfortunately, when you read through the CPT codebook, there's absolutely no documentation guidelines for how to do a history. Uh, now, there's all kind of stuff if you go into the evaluation and management codes. But in these ophthalmological codes, there's absolutely no guidelines for doing a patient history. So you almost kind of default to evaluation and management stuff just to have some references. And it, again, just like everything else, the level of history. And levels of history is an evaluation and management term. It's not, a, it's not really uh, pertinent when you're talking about the ophthalmological codes. But since we have no reference, I wanted to give some reference. So the level of history uh, that's documented is dependent on your judgment, again, and the nature of the problem. And you're going to, of course, record chief complaint, history of present illness, and the other things you see on the slide. The second thing, and this is really, when I, when I do audits and consults and look at people's records, this is by far probably one of the biggest, thing, the biggest things that's omitted, and it's the general medical observation. It's a service component of the eye exam that is required for both comprehensive and intermediate level services. So you've got to do this practically every time you examine the patient, no matter what. And just like with the patient history, the CPT codebook does not provide any 
documentation guidelines on how to do this stuff about what really is a general medical observation. And so I had to look it up in the medical dictionary and kind of go in a medical slant to get information here. And what it is is the act of watching the patient carefully and attentively in an attempt to identify the presence of ocular or systemic conditions that may exist without symptoms. So this is you just looking at the patient, not what the patient's complaining about, not what the patient's saying. It's just whatever you see. And, and the observations could include uh, some kind of assessment of their appearance, their mobility, uh, any compensatory adaptations like a head tilt if they've got some kind of vertical uh, 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 imbalance. So these are, are examples of uh, things that you would look at under general medical observation. Uh, it could also encompass these following areas, development, nutrition, uh, the body habitus, deformities, uh, grooming. Uh, and all you do is whatever you're seeing, you write down in the record. Uh, the prime example for me, the most common one, would be, uh, let's say I've got a 50-year-old patient in the chair, and under my general medical observation, I would put a, a well-groomed, well-developed female in no apparent distress. Uh, so I'm, dis I'm, I'm looking at them. They, they, they've, their grooming is good. They've had a bath. The hair is combed. Uh, no kind of body odor. Uh, and, and they're not appearing to be in any distress. Uh, they don't look like they're suffering. They don't look like they're hurting. So just whatever you see without asking them any questions is your general medical observation. The gross visual fields, same kind of thing. Uh, the, the CPT code book gives no documentation requirements or guidelines for examining the field. Uh, the way we were trained, the most common method is doing confrontations. Uh, you would do all four quadrants, and, you know, always. Uh, you could use tangent screens, perimeters, anything you wanted. It doesn't specify the method. You've just got to prove that you made some attempt at examining the visual field in a gross manner or in a sophisticated manner. It doesn't have to really be gross. It could be a perimeter, and you could just record the results. But you've got to do something to check their visual field. The basic sensory motor exam involves assessing either ocular motility, motility accommodation, or binocular vision function, really some aspect of all three is best. Uh, it, it allows you to evaluate how, the, how these three systems work together. Uh, and like everything else so far, uh, there's no real uh, specific uh, documentation guidelines, so you can do as much or as little as you want. Uh, you can measure accommodative app and call it a day. You can do versions, ductions, uh, whatever you want, uh, just something. You've got to prove that you looked at it and you made some kind of assessment of the person's basic sensory motor system. The next service component is an external ocular examination. Once again, no documentation guidelines, uh, but in a general sense, the external exam is looking at the external ocular and facial areas. It's basically an inspection. You're just looking at it. Uh, you're looking at it in a well-lighted room, paying attention to the skin and the eyelids. It's face-to-face. -face. It's not biomicroscopy. It's just you looking at them. And if you got to touch them, if you see something funny, you got to squeeze on something, press on it, you got to palpate, that's part of this examination. That's part of this service component. So external ocular examination. And a lot of doctors confuse this service component with what used to be called the external ocular examination with biomicroscopy. Now they just, they meaning the CPT code book, just called it biomicroscopy. So external ocular exam, basically looking at the forehead, the nose, the cheeks, the eyelids, trying to see if they've got rosacea, <clears throat> stuff like that. Uh, that's, that's what you're looking for here. The next service component is called the adnexal examination, and it focuses primarily on the five bulleted areas that you see, eyelids, extraocular muscles, orbits, the preauricular lymph nodes, and the lacrimal apparatus. Uh, from an eyelid point of view, we just looked at the eyelids when we were doing the external ocular exam, but here you're looking more at positioning as opposed to appearance. So you're looking at is the, uh, the upper and lower eyelids in correct apposition to the globe? Is the upper eyelid drooped down any, any kind of ptosis, uh, any kind of mu extraocular muscle exam? And again, not really uh, versions and inductions, but you know, it, trying to see if, if, if one of them may be swollen, uh, some kind of impingement. Uh, looking at the orbits, any kind of proptosis, uh, the preauricular lymph nodes, if there's any tenderness, and some evaluation of the lacrimal apparatus, uh, which you see as the punctum, the canaliculus, the lacrimal sac, and the nasolacrimal duct. So quite a bit of, of evaluation involved in this adnexal examination, 
And remember, all this is done really without the slit lamp. You're just kind of looking at the person, touching them, maybe palpating the lymph nodes, uh, you know, just a, a physical examination. The next service component is biomicroscopy. And biomicroscopy involves examining the 10 things that you see here. I'm not going to read the slide to you. Everybody can see it. But, and everybody does biomicroscopy all day, every day, so I don't really need to talk about this. We all know what this is. Uh, we may not know what, the, what the, the, the general medical observation is, but we all know what this is and should be very skilled at, at performing and documenting aspects of this exam. The next service component of an ophthalmological exam is ophthalmoscopy. Uh, and just like most things, the CPT codebook doesn't really tell you how to do it, whether you're doing direct ophthalmoscopy or indirect ophthalmoscopy, it doesn't really say that it has to be dilated pupil or undilated pupil. Uh, it just says you better look in there and document that you looked in there. Uh, you've got to prove that you looked inside the eye. Uh, you've got to make some notation of the vitreous, the macula, the vessels, and the retinal periphery. So that would be ophthalmoscopy. Uh, in years past, uh, there were several Medicare carriers that demanded uh, a dilated uh, fundus examination in order to report a comprehensive level service, those rules do not exist anymore. Uh, when you look in the CPT code book, uh, the, several years ago they were trying to infer that uh, the dilated pupil exam had to be performed to report the comprehensive level service. As recently as the 2015 CPT code book, it is simply a recommendation. If that, it says that you can do a dilated fundus exam if you want to, uh, when you're doing a comprehensive exam. If you don't, you still can report a comprehensive exam. So a lot of, of misinformation and old information regarding the, the requirement of a dilated pupil exam associated with reporting a comprehensive level service. Those rules do not exist anymore, uh, either in the CPT code book or in any Medicare carrier. Uh, they probably have a higher chance of existing in some vision care plan uh, like IMED or Superior Vision or something, as opposed to some medical plan. Uh, so this is the, the second to the last service component, ophthalmoscopy. When you're doing your eye exam, you know, you're getting toward the end of the exam. You've, you've, you've evaluated most of these service components. Now you're coming to the very last thing, which is the initiation of a diagnostic and treatment program. And so now you're going to start making decisions. You're going to, you're going to have to exercise some medical decision making. That's part of the exam, is, is exercising some medical decision making. So you've done all this work. You've listened to the patient, taken the history, uh, made some assessment of the nature of the presenting problem. And now you're going to evaluate the complexity of the symptoms, all your findings. Uh, if you need to order and perform more tests, uh, any other concurrent problems you've got to evaluate, and then finally, you're going to make some decision and, and make some determination of what you think is wrong with the patient and, and then decide if you're going to do anything about it, such as follow-up care, medicine, classes, whatever it may be. So now you've come to the, you've done all this exam, you've looked at all the different parts of the eye, you've looked at their face, you've done all kind of uh, sensory motor stuff, checked their feels, looked at their, 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 just looked at them, made decisions, and now you come to this last service component, the initiation of a diagnostic and treatment program. And again, this, this is at the conclusion of the exam. So one of these things, one of those four bullets has to occur for you to be able to report an ophthalmological service, for you to report a medical eye exam, either a comprehensive or an intermediate exam. At the end of the exam, one of these four things has to happen. You've either got to prescribe some medicine, you've got to prescribe some lenses or some other therapy, you've got to arrange for special ophthalmological diagnostic testing or treatment services, you got to arrange for some kind of consultation, get a second opinion, or you got to order some lab test or radiological test. One of, these, one of these bullets here has to occur for at the end of the exam for it to qualify and for you to report this level of service. Fortunately, almost always, uh, for, for the vast majority of us, the, the very first thing, well, it, it almost to skip a slide, you know, you're still going to make these decisions. Are you going to recommend further testing, glasses, contacts? I mean, what I just said, you're going to, are you going to do any of this stuff? And what most of us do to fulfill this requirement is we perform a refraction. So imagine that the patient comes in, uh, they've told you what they think is wrong with them. Uh, you start examining them. Uh, you know, you can perform a comprehensive ophthalmological examination 
with an occluder and a direct ophthalmoscope. Uh, you don't need a, a slit lamp. You don't need a phoropter. Uh, you don't need you need a you need an ophthalmoscope and a, an occluder, and you can perform a comprehensive exam 92004. Now you can't really figure out everything that's wrong with the person until maybe you start running some tests. And the very first test that practically every optometrist does is to order a refraction. So you want to see how well your patient can see. You're going to order and perform a refraction. You may do it. Your tech may do it. Uh, you may have one of these fancy automated phoropters now. It takes two minutes. Great. Whatever you do. But you're going to order and perform a refraction. The CPT code book says the refraction has its own code, 92115. And at the end of the refraction, you're going to do one of those four things when you write a prescription, if they need one, the lens type, power, axis, and so on. Those are the, the legal requirements in the CPT code book for a refraction. But the, the ordering and performance of the refraction meets the requirements, the very first requirement and the last requirement uh, of, of the ophthalmological exam, where you're initiating the diagnostic and treatment program. The refraction is a component of that. The medical decision making is a component of that. So it's, it's not just doing stuff, doing tests, spinning dials, uh, uh, turning wheels, asking questions. The very end of the exam, when you've when you, when you got to think about the whole shebang, you know, reporting, the, the billing and coding, the medical eye exam, this medical decision part right at the end is critical to finishing the thing off and getting the job done right. So that's what we're talking about as far as billing and coding the medical eye exam. Remember, we talked about different definitions of an exam. Uh, whoever's paying for the exam is the, the one that makes the rules. We talked uh, in detail about the medical legal aspect of an eye exam and how we are not really in control, that it may be a bunch of judges and lawyers that affect how we do things and, and define the standard of care, that it may not be eye doctors defining the standard of care. It's, it's probably going to be judges and lawyers uh, and insurance companies uh, defining the standard of care. Uh, we talked about uh, optometrists and malpractice and how that's really not something we need to worry about. Uh, talked about CPT and, or current procedural terminology and how that's your base reference whenever you don't have a reference. And then the, the nine different service components that actually make up an eye exam under the current procedural terminology guidelines. If you understand those nine service components, when you pick and choose to do them, you know, it depends on the nature of the problem. It depends what's wrong with the person. You don't always have to do a comprehensive exam. In my office, the ratio is approximately two to one. Uh, we do about 8,000 patient visits a year between me and my partner, and approximately 33% of our examinations are comprehensive exams. Approximately 60%, uh, 66% are intermediate exams, and that's the way it's been for years, and it just seems like that's the way it falls out when you know what you're doing and, and you uh, and you deliver the examinations based on medical necessity, not based on how much money you want to make or what you want to do. So those are the things to, to factor in and to remember when you're trying to decide how you're going to, to report uh, and perform an eye exam, a medical eye exam. They're all medical eye exams every time you shake their hand. Always remember that medical legal aspect, uh, and you will be fine going forward. I think that's it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. If you got any questions, give us a call. Today's lecture is uh, 
to get out easily. Uh, are, but you cannot do autofluorescence for an H5. Everyone, my name is is going to increase omega three D eight. Do at least once a day, though, because today's lecture is ultra wide field autofluorescence. I'm going to speak about the advantage of this patient. Here's an optic nerve up with a bit scar. Reading the diagnosis, which uh, I shouldn't, but makes it a little bit simpler. What uh, the autofluorescence in a tiny little dot is why the and the retina. Hi, this is Mark Friedberg. I'm the retinal specialist. Look at the retina to determine cancer, which can cause max. Um, we see this area here. That's this is a retinal picture. When we look at the OCT scan, abnormal. And lastly, uh, on a daily basis. Way.
today's lecture is to get out easily. But you cannot do autofluorescence for an H5. Everyone, my name is I'm going to increase omega 3 A. Do at least once a day, though, because. Today's lecture is ultra wide field autofluorescence, and I'm going to speak about the advantage of this patient. Here's an optic nerve end up with a bit scar. Reading of the diagnosis, which uh, I shouldn't, but makes it a little bit simpler. Uh, what the autofluorescence in? Tiny little dot. Here's why. This and the retina. 